Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Emily, the BCHA's Director of Outreach. I've just got a couple quick things to say before tonight's panel on climate justice in Canada. Um, so tonight, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanic peoples, whose historical relationships with the land continue to this day. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be on this shared territory, although I was not invited to do so. Um, given tonight's turnout, everyone has been muted to prevent any inadvertent interruptions to our speakers. Um, but during the open Q&A portion towards the end of tonight's event, feel free to use the chat function to ask questions, but obviously be respectful of one another and our speakers. Um, we're recording this talk and it will be released uh, to our YouTube channel sometime early next week and also to our podcast. Um, and I'll share that on social media when it's available. Our next special virtual event, a panel on medical assistance in dying is coming on October 22nd. So please keep an eye on our newsletter and social media for information on how to RSVP to that soon. So um, starting with Dr. James Rowe, I'll let our panelists introduce themselves and tell you how about their work on the climate crisis and how they first got involved. Awesome, thanks, Emily. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm broadcasting from the University of Victoria on uh, Songhees territory. Uh, I'm an associate professor of environmental studies and I'm a researcher with the corporate mapping project, which investigates the uh, power of the carbon extractive sector in particularly Western Canada. And part of my work with the Corbin Map Mapping Project comes out of uh, previous activism with the fossil fuel divestment movement uh, here on campus, but also uh, more nationally as well. And uh, how I first became involved, gosh, uh, that's a good, <laughs> question. I was reflecting with my students about how the first time I learned about climate change was in grade six in 1989. Um, and uh, so I guess maybe I'll just give a shout out to uh, Madame Giroux, my uh, grade six teacher. <laughs> Emma, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Jane. Um, I use she, her pronouns. I'm currently living on the homelands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples and the Wasanic peoples, also known as um, like Victoria or Vancouver Island. Um, and I am a first year political science student at the University of Victoria. Um, I started uh, working on climate action projects about a year and a half ago. Um, I'm part, I was part of Climate Strike Canada, as well as I helped to build Arthur Future, which is like the local Victoria chapter of Climate Strikes. Um, and I've worked on various different projects. Um, I uh, campaigned a lot in the 2019 election for the Green Party. Um, and just recently, I was the comms coordinator for Omita Kuttner's Green Party leadership campaign. Um, and I'm also now was just elected a uh, vice chair of Moonlight Institute, um, which is an institute to kind of create pathways for a livable future in a, like a nonpartisan way. Um, so those are some of the things that I'm doing. It's great to be here. Awesome. And Catherine? Um, I'm Kathy Harrison. I'm a professor of political science at the University of British Columbia. I'm currently in London, Ontario, though, visiting my mom. And uh, I am on the uh, traditional ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe people. Um, my history is a, a bit different. I'm going to reveal my age. Uh, so when I was in public school in 1967, um, my teacher, there was a big map of Canada at the front of the board, and he pointed to Northern Alberta and said, this is going to be Canada's contribution to the world. There's oil in the ground there, and we figure out how to get it out and get it off to markets. You know, this will be our, our um, doing the world a favor. Um, and I guess I took that kind of seriously, and I started out my career as a chemical engineer. I worked in the oil industry in the tar sands. Um, and then somewhere along the way, I went to grad school, um, started in chemical engineering, switched, ended up doing my PhD in political science. And I've been studying environmental policy for very many years, um, climate policy for more than 15. Um, and how did I get involved? Um, well, sort of it was, a, it was an obvious big question in, um, as an academic, but um, I started 
speaking out more because I was inspired by my kids. So I had taught them, you know, poor kids who have a professor for a parent, they were always learning about climate change from diapers pretty much. Um, and um, they started doing stuff as high school activists and organizing a group called Kids for Climate Action. And they were doing events and talking to the media. And I thought if these kids are willing to step outside their comfort zone and do this stuff, why aren't I doing it? more. So since then, I have um, spent a lot more time doing public facing work on government advisory bodies and um, doing media interviews, writing op eds. I was quite involved in a fight against a coal port in Surrey. Um, yeah, so that's me. Fantastic. Um, so our first question, uh, starting with Kathy, it's been one year since the global climate strike. Um, what are the biggest impacts you've seen in the wake of that movement, politically, culturally, and environmentally? Um, I think the youth climate strikes are the single thing in many years that has given me the most hope. Um, I don't think we have seen um, big environmental impacts yet, although I suspect that in Canada, the attention to the climate change hurt the, um, the Conservative Party's vote in the federal election nationally. Um, but I do think it's an important cultural and political moment to see children <laughs> organizing and demanding better. And I think it's been building for quite some time, but to have it take off, um, I think has a lot of potential. I am troubled by the impact of COVID-19 this year and for part of next year and sort of taking some of the wind out of the sails of that movement. I have no doubt it will be back. And Emma, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I think there's a couple of things. Um, like being a part of it, I think one of the biggest things that have really um, impacted like youth is the fact that we feel really connected with each other and we've built this movement that really um is about hope um and I think a lot of the times like in the media and stuff I always get questions about like oh well, like people don't like it like you're messaging around climate because they're really scared and they get afraid um and the thing is is I think that within our organizations we've really been able to come together over that shared fear and turn it into hope and that's something that I'm really inspired by to see like my fellow organizers doing and we're really creating so many communities along the way. So I think that's one really big impact is like this community spirit that we've been able to generate because that will help. That's the only thing that's gonna help us solve these crises is if we are a community and we say, this is important, this is a problem and we need to solve it. And then the other thing is the influence on political culture. And I think that Canada specifically um, the climate movement has really influenced political culture. I don't think we've seen it in terms of exact like electoral like elections because um, it's a very it, it was something that happened so fast and usually it takes a really long time to actually like manifest that into votes. Um, but I think that it is the country has really waken, woken up and, and has really responded to that in different ways. Um, so I really think that it, it's really shaped kind of this, this new kind of realm of culture um, within Canada. Totally. And uh, Dr. Rowe? Uh, yeah, I'll just build on uh, what both Catherine and, and Emma just had to say there. I, I do think <laughs> that COVID-19 is a real bummer because 2019 and 2020 saw social movements in Canada really change the conversation, really move the ideological goalposts. So the climate strike movement in 2019, you know, I think it did have a, a small impact or it did have an impact on the election and the Canadians were polling you know, climate change as one of their most salient issues. And so that hasn't necessarily translated into the kind of policy we need, but it is changing the culture as, as uh, Emma suggested. And then likewise, we saw solidarity actions across the country with the Wet'suwet'en uh, in February, you know, really like world historical social movement interventions that, that then kind of got evaporated with the emergence of the pandemic. And, and so that's not to say that those activities aren't still afoot and that, that the kind of internal organizing that Emma's referencing still isn't, isn't 
there that can then be accessed at another point in the future. But we are kind of in a in a bit of um, the, the the pandemic has thrown things for a world. And I myself don't yet know how to respond. I'm not sure how, how movements will be responding, but 2019, 2020 was, was a good year for activism, even though it was a cataclysmic uh, sort of year as well, but uh, the pandemic has definitely upended things. Yeah, for sure. Um, kind of going off of that. So obviously the pandemic has hindered any large scale recreation of the global climate strike this year. Um, but how have you seen this work continue in spite of the pandemic, like in bigger, smaller, or like maybe not completely obvious ways? Um, and what might it look like going forward as the pandemic kind of lessens? Starting with James. Um, well, yeah, I think that um, the way that youth who are organizing for a Green New Deal in Canada have pivoted to a just recovery, I think that's a good rhetorical shift that's been made. And, um, and I think that's the right framework. And, you know, Canadians, I think, are very much in support with a robust government response that helps us meet our environmental goals as we also uh, deal with some of the equity and, and um, uh, economic disruption has been wrought by the pandemic. Um, on that same front, you know, like others probably here who are political junkies watched the vice presidential debate last night and it was interesting to see the Green New Deal mobilized as a bogeyman by, uh, by the right, but it does sort of suggest how powerful that framing and movement is. And uh, the Democrats under Biden are looking to implement something that's Green New Deal-esque if they, if they win. And so again, in a short period of time, uh, driven by young people, the Sunrise Movement in the US and, and, and activists with 350 and other organizations in Canada, uh, that kind of just recovery frame has gained a lot of salience and, and is, has the potential to get actualized in some form if come November, uh, we get a, an outcome that we can live with. Yeah, totally. What are your thoughts on this, Emma Jane? Yeah, so I totally agree about um, that just recovery piece. Um, and in that too, I think it's like this recognition that um, for something that like, I know that I and a lot of others have been saying for so long is that like climate justice is like interconnected with all of the crises we face. So right now that means the pandemic and also inequities um, and, and many of the issues that we face. And so we have to address, we have to address them all. Um, and um, yeah, like climate justice is so linked um, with all of these problems that we can't just be like, oh, we're doing this and now we're doing this, but we have to really address them holistically. Um, and so I think that's something that we've been really focusing on as well in the pandemic, trying to do that in like an online space as well, because um, we've been really trying to take up the online space with different like hashtags and different movements trending online um, to kind of still have that uh, like big like feeling of like a big movement, um, but that doesn't necessarily represent like people in a space, but like people in, in an online space. Um, so yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and Kathy? Um, I'm not so sure that the Green New Deal is a winner in Canada yet. Um, I, my concern is it's been associated with the NDP. Um, and that will tend to limit its impact. What I'm interested to see is if the Democrats, if Biden gets elected, and honestly, the Biden plan is pretty Green New Deal-ish, has a lot of the elements, will that um, spill across the border? Because I think thus far, um, it's been, you know, it's been more limited within um, the leftmost party. Um, discourse in Canada. Um, what I do think is really encouraging is that although um, I've been doing some polling with colleagues and we had a poll we did over 2019 and then we added a fifth wave to it in May. And what we found is that, um, you know, there was a drop in the fraction of people who identify climate change as one of their top two issues of concern. Um, but there was very little impact on the average level of concern about climate change and there was no impact on policy support. Now the policy we were looking at was carbon pricing, which is a tough sell. And so the fact that people didn't go running from it 
is a good sign we didn't ask about, but I suspect there has been much, uh, there's much greater support for public spending along the lines that James was talking about, which is, um, you know, build back better, a green recovery. Um, so, I, you know, I think that that's promising as we move through the next year, but I still think that we need, um, we need to have a core of regulatory actions, not just spending. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of related to that. So a recent UN report said that COVID-19 will do very little to slow the climate crisis. Um, what have you seen as the positive and negative impacts of the pandemic on the climate? Me? Who, who do you want? <laughs> um, well, negative has been that it is, you know, taken up all the oxygen in the room. It's, you know, it's delayed a lot of things, even if governments are still planning to do them. Um, it's also because it's hurt the economy. We're not just seeing governments pouring money into a green stimulus. They're giving lots of money to the fossil fuel industry as well. Um, so they're, um, they are re-stimulating the dirty economy as well as the green economy, and that's um, that's worrisome. Um, we have seen some regulatory relaxation, you know, cutting back in Alberta on um, monitoring of regulatory compliance. Um, so there's there's definitely be some negative things. Um, the shift in sort of top of mind issues, positive things, I think, is that it may have opened the door to thinking about climate policy in a much bolder and bigger way. Um, you know, the, this is a moment to do big stuff. Let's do big stuff with climate change in mind. Um, that may have contributed to the boldness of um, Biden's climate policy. I mean, he's a pretty centrist politician running against, you know, trying to steal votes from a right wing guy, but this is a moment. Um, and I hope that will be the case in Canada as well. Mm -hmm. And then Jane? Yeah, um, so I think that um, obviously COVID-19, I, I, I hesitate to say that there's any um, like positive things about it because honestly, it's not, it's not been good. Um, it's, it's totally, it's really destroyed our economy. It's uh, destroyed people's lives in many different ways. And I think that the biggest thing about specifically the economy is that it showed how fragile our economy is. The fact that um, one thing <laughs> um, can kind of flip this entire our entire system on its head um, and leave so many people who are already suffering in a worse position just shows how much change and transformation we need. And so I think that this pandemic can really be an opportunity uh, for resilience and for learning about what resilience actually means and like what community resilience means. Um, so that means like strengthening food security, water security, and making sure that we have climate and emergency preparedness as well as recognizing that as these um, things keep occurring, so pandemics um, and the effects of climate change, that we recognize that this there's a really huge um, trauma that's going to happen in our communities and how we respond to that trauma with resilience and, and preparing communities for that trauma is really important um, because it is, it is devastating and it will, um, it will be so detrimental um, in so many different ways. And so I think that resilience piece is really, really important. And it's something that um, we really have an opportunity um, to start working on. Yeah, definitely. Um, James? Um, so I haven't gotten to read the book yet, but I read the short article that Seth Klein recently penned for the Taiyi about his new book, um, A Good War, uh, yeah, he's using that, the sort of war framework to make sense. Yeah, mobilizing Canada for the climate emergency um, and sort of looking back to World War II for exemplars of how we can address uh, the climate crisis. And you know, his first principle that he shares in this short article in the Taiyi is to adopt an emergency mindset. And so if, if there is a positive thing coming out of the pandemic, it's that we've had the experience of, of seeing uh, governments gen genuinely adopt an emergency mindset, take drastic action, citizens uh, engaging with that as well with some uh, lack of compliance in some in some areas, especially high orders of government in the U.S. But but um, but we, but we've seen a, a robust response, and and so people are now a bit more prepared for what that looks like. Just a side note: I don't have much more to add to to what both Emma Jane and Kathy said, but. 
I was reflecting for myself personally at the beginning of the pandemic at how um, I wasn't feeling as anxious as I thought I would be by, you know, wearing a mask in the grocery store or whatever else. And part of it was that like, given, you know, having one's head in the climate debates over the last decade is that I've kind of been like wanting and expecting emergency measures for years now. And so finally it felt to me actually congruent. Like the fact that I was having to change my behavior significantly, having to again, wear a mask in, in public, sanitize my hands uh, continuously, you know, again, this isn't what we're expecting with climate change, but at least it was uh, the kind of kind of emergency mobilization that I had been anticipating. In many respects, I actually felt like my anxiety level went down a little bit <laughs> for a while. So I'm like, finally, uh, we're actually acting uh, like there's an emergency. And so again, whether there's some positive yield of that as we respond to the climate emergency, we'll, we'll wait and see, but, but maybe, maybe there is some positive yield there. Mm -hmm. Um, so yesterday a national ban uh, was announced on six different types of single use plastics, including, including items like straws and plastic utensils. Um, what impact do you see this having on our climate and future climate initiatives? Um, let's start with Emma Jane this time. Yeah, so I think to start, um, it's really good stuff in terms of um, specifically for our oceans, I think um, it's really important in terms of, of cleaning that up and, and making sure um, that we don't continue to harm wildlife um, and stuff like that. However, I don't think that it, it can't be, we ban plastics and that's all we do. Um, and I really wanna emphasize that because I think that often specifically within like the Canadian political world, we tend to think like, oh, environmental policies is banning this and banning that and, and all of this stuff. Um, and, and I really wanna emphasize the fact that um, like banning plastics is great. It's a really great first step. However, it cannot be that singly that. Um, it has to be this, this full transformation of our society. Um, and so it can't be banning plastics as like the only thing we do. Um, but I do think that it will definitely help in terms of wildlife um, and, and cleaning up our oceans and stuff like that. Um, so it's definitely a good step, but it's not the only thing we should do. Yeah, definitely. Um, Kathy? Um, you know, I think, I think we, it's probably important to they celebrate. I mean, it's a good thing to do, but also to put it in context, um, because my concern always is with things that will have a relatively small impact that people will be like, you know, hey, I gave up straws and then get into their SUVs and drive off. Um, so, you know, I, I think it's it's a question of framing that these are important first steps, but they're small and we need a lot more. Um, I'm a big fan of banning. I think we should ban internal combustion engine vehicles, ban fossil fuel electricity, and ban heating our homes with fossil fuels. We don't have to do it overnight. We have to, you know, signal that we're going to do this, insist on um, phasing out those things over time. But um, I think we need to ban the big stuff not the straws. Yeah, definitely, I agree. But um, in terms of like what that would look like betterly and like what the expectations are realistically, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, I think that government, so something like um, motor vehicles, um, BC has led on this in Canada, said that they would um, require 100% of new vehicles sold to be zero emission by 2035. Um, I think they could move that forward. So we're getting lots of movement with uptake of electric vehicles, talk about hydrogen. But what they could do is, is establish a regulation that says you have to have this percent zero emission vehicles being sold um, by each vehicle retailer this year and gradually ramp it up to phase them all out by 2030. Yeah, definitely. And so it's predictable. It's not just off in the future that there's a schedule to do it. And, and the BC, the NDP uh, proposal does call for net zero ready, all new homes, all new buildings have to be net zero ready by 2032. Um, I'm not entirely sure what that means, but <laughs> so the, you know, some of that stuff is happening. Yeah, definitely. Um, James? I saw on... Um... Twitter yesterday, uh, a representative from Climate Justice Edmonton with a good take on the plastic ban saying, 
could we recategorize the Trans Mountain extension as a straw and ban it? <laughs> so uh, I think that gets to um, some of the concerns around, yes, this is a good thing. There's yield to this. Uh, but you know, again, we know that a day after the federal government um, declared a climate emergency in 2019, they announced uh, approval of, of Trans Mountain. And so, you know, with the climate emergency, uh, you know, we need to be significantly drawing down on our fossil fuel infrastructure, not building new stuff. And there's certain ways that this ban, while important, I think provides some cover to uh, policymakers to continue with uh, what uh, Seth Klein and Shannon Dobb from the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives call a new climate change denialism, which is acknowledging the science on climate change, but not actually taking the robust policy steps needed to, to address it. And you know, again, I think this is a good step, but there's certain ways that these more sort of middling approaches uh, offer some cover for the lack of drastic action required on climate change. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so given the events of the last year, what do you see as the future of oil and pipelines in Canada? Do you expect a shift in opinion on renewable energy in places like Alberta? Starting with James. Uh, yeah, that's a really good uh, question. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, the battle lines are drawn pretty strongly. I'm, I grew up in, in Alberta. Um, you know, I don't think we're going to see uh, some really rapid coming to God moments on, on climate change from folks who are really entrenched uh, with the industry there. I do think that some of the uh, sort of troubles that the industry is having in the financial world partly due to divestment, but also due to uh, COVID um, is, you know, opening up some space where even folks working in the new industry can recognize that there's larger market forces uh, at play and sort of technological advancements at play that, that may endanger the industry, which may help sort of soften and, and, and open up more support for, uh, for transition. Um, but, you know, Coming out of the corporate mapping project that I mentioned earlier, like one of our primary overall findings is that the organized obstruction of the fossil fuel industry is the primary reason why we're not seeing uh, faster action on climate change. And in as much as the industry has been a little bit weakened, at least financially, uh, in, in recent months, uh, they still have a tremendous amount of power that it will continue to wield. And so I think that our goal is, as uh, engaged citizens is to continue to call out that organized power and resistance and denialism and obstruction uh, sort of open up space for the kinds of uh, transformation that we uh, that we need. Yeah, totally. What are your thoughts on this, Emma Jane? Yeah, so I think the first thing I'll say on that is um, I totally understand why people specifically like maybe in Alberta or like in northern parts of BC um, are like reluctant to the transition. I can totally see that. And I think that we need to look at that and we need to use that. And I think one of the big reasons is like, obviously it's a huge source of income. And if you look at um, how, like how much of their income is supported by that, it's huge. And so I think that we really need to meet people where they're at and be like, okay, like this is a huge problem. And you're on an income that's not sustainable in terms of money and also in terms of the environment. Um, and so many people in those industries, um, it like some of them, it is a really good source of income and some of them is not. So it's looking at how we can transition together. But I think we need to really meet people where they're at first and be like, okay, this is what needs to happen. And we want to support everybody through this transition and that making sure that no one gets left behind is really, really important. Um, and yeah, so I think it's, it's really compassion and empathy and recognizing these are the problems and we have the solutions. Um, and I think that in some ways, um, it's kind of been this battle uh, between like left and right or between like climate activists and fossil fuel proponents, but it doesn't need to be like that. Um, it needs to be about compassion and community and empathy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what about you, Kathy? You have kind of a unique perspective on this. I've gotten pretty cynical about some of this. Like James said, I mean, the, the, um, 
the oil industry is very powerful in Canada um, and they keep winning. Um, even as the majors are pulling out, even as insurance companies are refusing to insure them, you know, they're offering sort of greenwash proposals that they'll get to carbon neutral by 2050. Um, so I do have some hope. I have hope that the rest of the world will put our oil industry out of business. That as the countries of the world act on the Paris Agreement and ideally ratchet up the ambition of their national targets under the Paris Agreement, what we will see is demand for oil fall. Um, and when that happens, our relatively costly and carbon intensive oil is likely to be among the first to go. We're starting to see that. The Alberta oil industry is not, partic is not mostly hit because of COVID. They're mostly hit because oil prices globally are so low and they fell at the end of 2014 and they have not rebounded. And I don't think they will. Now, what worries me is um, if governments, instead of acknowledging there's this transition happening, let's provide retraining for workers. Let's have an honest conversation that some communities are gonna get smaller. People are gonna move. Um, to where the new jobs are, they're not gonna be in Fort McMurray. Um, if we don't do that and instead, you know, buy a pipeline and build it, what we are doing is both putting off the pain that will happen, but also in so doing, continuing to flood global markets with um, fossil fuels, which undermines the efficacy of climate policies. So, um, yeah, uh, I, I, I want to believe you, Emma Jane, <laughs> and uh, I hope everyone in Alberta listens to you. And I think you're a, a very powerful speaker for them to listen to. Yeah, absolutely. I hope so, too. Um, but yeah, so NPR released an article several weeks ago that uncovered that only 10% of all plastics have ever been recycled and that the fossil fuel industry was a large force behind the whole recycling movement. Um, on an individual and societal level, what actions would you like to see taken in the, la in the next five years to combat the impact of all of this plastic and to further prevent the production of plastic waste? Uh, starting with Kathy. Um, I'm, I applaud everybody who takes individual action voluntarily, people who give up their cars and take transit and ride bikes and forego plastics and um, eat um, an organic diet. Those are all wonderful things. And I think that plays an important role in setting an example of what's possible, but I do not think we should count on individual action. We need laws. We need governments to pass rules that everybody has to abide by. And so I'm, I worry actually about putting too much emphasis on encouraging individual changes in action. Um, the most offensive one of which is suggesting that, you know, another uh, the young generation should not have children because my generation screwed up the planet. And instead, let's focus on what governments can do through collective action. That's their job. That's what will work. Um, and plastics is part of that, but there's so much more. Yeah, definitely. Emma Jane? Yeah, I would definitely agree with Kathy on that in terms of individual actions. I think that it kind of putting an emphasis too much on individual actions allows governments to be complicit. Um, and I think that we as individuals have a responsibility to stand up and be like, no, this is actually your job. Um, that we have a role to play here. Everybody has a part to play, but this is your job. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing um, in terms of like plastics in general. Um, I would love to see, yeah, governments actually implementing um, real climate policies that they actually, um, like they campaign on and they actually implement because right now we're not seeing that. We're seeing just little things here and there. Um, and it's just, it's not uh, good enough. Yeah, totally. James? Um, yeah, I'll agree, just totally agree with, uh, what Emma Jane and Kathy had to say about individual versus social or structural or systemic or policy action. Uh, I guess on this question, you know, what it begs for me is like, why, why didn't we better know that um, only 10% of plastics uh, were being effectively recycled? And I'd say that the simple answer without doing any research would be the force of the plastics lobby 
uh, themselves and and also the fossil fuel lobby as well, given that they are a feedstock for uh, for plastics. And I do know that with a, a plastic ban that was pursued by uh, the municipal municipal government here in in Victoria, that it was successfully challenged by the Canadian Plastics Association. And I, I may be getting their name wrong exactly, uh, but you know we know that industry is mobilizing at every step. Uh, to obstruct and I think that that needs to be made as clear as day or as clear as possible so that we know what we're up against and when we're, it's clear to us that there's these large powerful forces behind the scenes that are working actively against the goals that we need that actually helps clarify that our individual action while you know it's important for our own sense of well-being it's really a drop in the bucket and we need to be fighting at different scales so to try to undo some of the power that uh, these companies have and the way they're able to wield that power to bend the ear of our uh, policymakers on a daily basis such that we have uh, the unsustainable situation that we're living with now, whether it's on plastics or on climate change. Uh, just as a follow-up, what do you think is the best way to take direct action against lobby groups like that from blocking movements? Oh, uh, yeah, great question. Um, so, you know, I guess uh, the, I, you know, I don't have a sort of one size fits all. I do think that the divestment movement on the fossil fuel front has done a really good job of that. Its sort of goal has been to target the power of the fossil fuel industry to block and obstruct climate legislation to try to render the industry a pariah you know something um, that investors are ashamed to uh, align themselves with and i think that there's been some inroads uh, made on that uh, front basically trying to turn fossil fuel industry into tobacco and you know, obviously in Canada, it remains a, a, a very a important and powerful industry, especially in Alberta and, and in BC. But I do think that we're starting to see globally that shift happening. And when the power of the industry is weakened that way and their social license to operate is reduced, then I think that their ability to work behind the scenes effectively is, is diminished. I do think that it's not a coincidence that, that following the divestment movement uh, we saw the sort of explosion of Green New Deal discourse, and there was actually a lot of activists from divestment that then graduated into Green New Deal activism, because I think divestment has helped open the space for this larger imagination of, of transformation, and part of the way it's done that is by helping to just, you know, at the beginning, we haven't accomplished it completely by any stretch of the imagination, but beginning to culturally marginalize this very powerful industry and create space for us to have discussions about the bold transformations needed. Now the next step is to actually actualize them in policy. And again, as Kathy noted at the beginning, if we do see a, a Biden victory in November, we'll we'll see a you know a multi-trillion dollar uh, uh, investment package that's similar to a Green New Deal, and we'll start to see what that looks like. So, um, trying to culturally marginalize shame and shame and blame. Yeah, for sure. Um, so starting again with you, uh, James. Uh, so what role do you think climate policy will play in the fate of this month's BC election? And what type of climate policies give uh, candidates the biggest electoral advantage in your opinion? And how has this evolved over recent years? Let me know if you want me to break that down. It's a very like big question. Sorry, was that me or did you say Emma Jane? Uh, no, you. Oh, oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> Could you re repeat it, the question? I'm sorry. Absolutely. Um, so it's kind of a little bit of a like three component question. So what do you think uh, climate policy, like the role it will play on the fate in this month's uh, BC election and um, kind of going off of that, what type of po climate policies give candidates the biggest electoral advantage and how has it evolved over recent years, like that kind of electoral advantage? Okay. Um, yeah, so I um, suffered through the hour-long debate that happened today between the three parties on uh, climate policy. It was interesting to watch, uh, especially having watched the first presidential and vice presidential election 
down south and that all three parties here in this jurisdiction at least accept the science on climate change and indeed it was the bc liberals that introduced our initial carbon tax that had support from much of the environmental movement so we're in a unique situation here in bc where uh, which isn't necessarily the case in alberta or, or in ontario or in saskatchewan uh, where again all three major parties uh, accept the science and so then the debate is really about how are we going to move forward uh, on, on it. Um, given that all three parties um, sort of accept the science, you know, I, I, I'm not sure how much impact climate change itself will have on the election. Um, you know, yeah, it, it's a good question. I, I'm not sure it will have much of, a, of an impact. There's definitely distance between the three parties. The Liberals haven't released their platform, so I can't you know, offer any kind of robust comparison, we'll kind of have to wait until uh, all the platforms are out. Um, in terms of what kinds of policies give an electoral advantage, I think historically climate policy has been uh, an electoral disadvantage for, for parties and candidates. Um, in, and that's partly because of effective conservative framing around jobs versus the environment. You know, Christy Clark had that nice framing uh, of the party of no, uh, referencing both NDPs and Greens. And I don't, obviously say I don't agree with that framing, but I think it's very effective for uh, the multiracial working class that comprises the majority of the Canadian polity. And so I think our goal is to find uh, climate policies and climate solutions that help to sort of break that jobs versus environment dichotomy. And that's where I do think that a public investment approach paired with regulations as well, a uh, public investment approach such as a just recovery framing or Green New Deal type uh, framing, if we don't use those exact terms, helps to uh, break those apart. Because what it says, is, it says, look, um, we're actually going to be generating uh, you know, potentially millions of new jobs as we're addressing our sustainability challenges. So you don't have to pick one or the other. In fact, it's by uh, moving in this direction that we're actually opening up new economic opportunities. And so I think that framing actually does poll very well in Canada and in the United States. And so I think that's the way that uh, policy can be framed in a way that climate policy can be framed in a way that's not just this anchor that, um, loses votes for, for parties and candidates, but it actually can result in some electoral breakthroughs. Yeah, absolutely. Emma Jane? Yeah, so I didn't actually catch the debate today. I was in a class of um, what was happening, but I I think there's a couple of things here. So one, um, uh, with like last year, part of the climate strike movement, um, my climate strike group actually got to meet with the premier and the um, minister of environment. Um, and basically, um, at first it was really great. Um, we talked a lot about really important issues. Um, and we, we even got invited back to the legislature to, um, in some revealings of different parts of clean BC. Um, but I'm actually, I was quite disappointed with clean BC and how it turned out. I think that it was a way for the government to create a really fancy, nice clip art plan that didn't actually, um, that said it would address some of the issues, um, but in actuality, most of them haven't gotten implemented and most of them actually didn't go far enough. Um, so that was really, like, I was really sad about that. I was like, no, and then they approved like LNG and all of that stuff happened. Um, and I was like, why, <laughs> like, what are you doing? Like I sat in your office and you told me that you would have my future, like you would have my future into consideration and you're not. Um, and I, I was really frustrated with, with that. And I'm really annoyed by politicians that continue to um, like commit lip service um, to like climate activists about this. Um, however, I, I will say that I am encouraged by some of the policies that I'm seeing coming out. Like James said, um, there I, the full platforms haven't been rolled out, um, but I know that the BC Greens just um, released their like community resiliency um, plan today, um, which is something that I talked about previously in this panel that I'm really excited about, that I'm really excited about this idea of resiliency in terms of making sure that we have sustainable and well-paying jobs and that we address the climate emergency and it doesn't have to be separate, but they have to be working together. And so that plan is something that I'm really excited about. Um, 
and I'm hopefully that will generate some momentum in terms of electoral success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Kathy? Um, I'm with James. I'm not sure how big an impact uh, climate will have on the outcome. I mean, the NDP are far ahead in the polls. That's why they've called an election right now, a very opportunistic moment in the middle of a pandemic. Um, the, uh, I mean, in terms of what we're hearing, all of the parties are sort of wanting to throw a lot of money around. Um, that can be good if it's money that's well-directed. It can be bad if it's just buying people's votes with their own money and giving them a sense of well-being for measures that will actually have very small impact. So I do find it encouraging that some of the uh, household subsidies that are in the NDP platform would be means tested like e-vehicles. I think maybe the um, home retrofits, um, there's, you know, but I'm troubled that there hasn't been much discussion about regulatory or carbon pricing measures because that's going to deliver the big changes over the long term. That's what's going to incentivize technological change. So we're talking about helping families and investing in industry, but they're all subsidies. Um, and some of them are good. Some of them I'm more concerned about. The uh, net zero 2050 goal um, could be good, but I'm worried about what we've heard so far because we have had way too many distant goals that sound great. Um, just saying it's going to be legislated doesn't mean anything to me. I want to know if that's going to be carbon budget legislation with interim targets and meaningful um, accountability to meet every one of those five-year targets. And the fact that they haven't said that worries me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so kind of going off of that, what are the biggest kind of greenwashing policies that you see in Canadian politics right now? And then what policies are you most hopeful about federally and in BC? Okay. Starting with Kathy, yeah. Um, say, okay, so I, God, I wish I had the exact words, but every time the prime minister says, we need to grow our economy in order to, our fossil fuel economy in order to fund the transition, away from fossil fuels. We need to build a pipeline and put money into the oil industry in order to fund a low carbon transition is like me saying, um, I need to eat a lot of ice cream to build up my strength to go on a diet. It makes no sense. And, um, and trying to dress it up by saying that any profits from the Trans Mountain expansion project will all be dedicated to environmental causes just makes it worse. Um, from my perspective. I want to add one thing. Um, when I said my big hope is that the rest of the world puts our oil industry out of business, I want to clarify that's kind of my most hopeful image for containing the emissions from that sector. I am not hopeful for destroying communities and people's livelihoods. I think we can do a whole lot better on that. Mm -hmm, yeah. Emma, Jane? Yeah, so I think um, I agree with Kathy in terms of, I love that ice cream analogy, by the way. It's a really good one. I'm going to steal that. My, my <laughs> daughter says it's fat shaming, though, and she she doesn't approve of it. But I do yeah. always say I need to go on a diet, so what the hell. <laughs> yeah, um, you can get on a diet to be healthy. So there's that. Yes. That's a good thing. That was the um, discussion. <laughs> but yeah, so I think that in terms of, um, yeah, there's so many policies that they say over and over that are just like, I'm just like, what? Like every single time I'm just like, oh no. Um, specifically like in BC, specifically like the LNG, uh, Site C, like there's so many, there's so many, um, even the like plastic bag ban, I think is, is one of them where it's like, we're gonna do one incremental thing. And I think that that's, that's the really key issue for me is that we've, we've run out of time for an incrementalist approach. We've run out, it, like it was years ago that you should have been banning plastic bags. In fact, like, Everyone says like we we're running out of time. We don't have 11 years. In fact, like it was yesterday that we needed to get these things done. Um, and so we really don't have time to wait for them to start um, caring. <laughs> like they need to care right now. And so um, the biggest thing for me is is transitioning to a green economy. Um, so developing a greenhouse gas reduction strategy um, that goes like beyond neutrality um, and where we actually get those like zero emissions. Um, also like 
making sure that we're establishing green jobs um, and and committing to that just recovery is really important. Um, and yeah, so those are just some of the things, but it really, my approach is really that it needs to be, it really needs to be a whole system shift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, James? Um, I would say that, you know, at, at this point, almost every significant policy offering in the Canadian political theater on climate change would be greenwashing <laughs> at some level, like in that I think that it's emblematic of this new climate change denialism or, or denialism 2.0 that I referenced before, where you know, acknowledges the importance of, of action, acknowledges science, whether it's on plastics in the ocean or in the case we're talking about tonight, climate change, and yet the scale of the policy just doesn't match the emergency situation. And so, you know, carbon taxation is a really important tool, but whether in BC or nationally, you know, the rates of taxation simply aren't uh, powerful enough to draw down emissions in the way that we require. And, and of course, you know, suddenly just taxing the public to the hilt is not going to be a politically popular or particularly feasible. So there's ways this has to be managed. But, but I do think that uh, most of our, almost all of our policy is, is a form of denialism at, at this point. Um, in terms of policy mechanism that I'm excited about, uh, again, I do think that because of this jobs versus environment challenge, like we, we need to make environmental policy something that's genuinely popular for the multiracial working class, not something that's perceived as a threat to their livelihood. And I don't think the environmental movement has historically been particularly good about talking and thinking about livelihood. And so this is why I do think that a public investment approach paired with regulation uh, is really important. And so I'm excited to see about you know, what comes out of uh, the Biden plan, if he is elected in, in November. Uh, there's a particular a sort of smaller scale policy mechanism in the city of Portland that I find interesting where they have a tax on the biggest corporations operating in uh, Portland and not just fossil fuel producers, but you know Amazon and other Costco, other big companies uh, where they're raising you know, millions of dollars that are then used to fund uh, transition activities within uh, the city of Portland with a racial justice lens guiding how those monies are spent. And so I think that's the kind of approach that we need where we're targeting uh, some of the, not only sort of industries causing the problem, but also large beneficiaries and those who can afford to pay more and sort of taking a Robin Hood approach and, and mobilizing those resources to benefit the multiracial uh, working class. I think that's a policy framework that's likely to be more popular than a more um, punitive one that punishes consumers uh, and doesn't target producers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, in 2016, Canada was ranked 11th in the world out of greenhouse gas emitting countries. Given this, can we as Canadians find uh, the most impactful while still direct action, or sorry, how can we as Canadians find the most impactful while still direct action to be taken to curb global emissions? And is it significant, is it worth significant effort on an individual, local, or even national level when there is disproportionately higher emissions from countries like China? Uh, starting with James. Can you repeat the the uh, the beginning? Eleventh, we're eleventh in the world in total emissions, or was it in greenhouse gas emissions? Okay, um, I think we're a little higher in per capita emissions. Right. But... Okay. Yeah. 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 So I think that um, I'd like to see the per capita. I wouldn't be surprised if we're near the near the top. Um, yeah, I think that you know it's. A, Climate change is a, I'm looking up at my world map as I'm speaking to you right now. Uh, you know, climate change is a, a massive collective action problem. There's, there's no doubt uh, about it. And, and yes, we are only 11th in, in total emissions and yet uh, we're massive consumers and we are, I think the fourth largest produ producer of fossil fuels uh, in the world. And so, you know, bear a significant responsibility. And, and I think it's really important to show uh, leadership in this regard. And, you know, the reality is, is that, you know, we know from the, the wildfires that just happened that in as much as we live on a seemingly large planet, it can get small really quickly. And that 
you know, we've had uh, smoke in the air here on Vancouver Island and in Vancouver from uh, Washington State, from, from Oregon, from California. Uh, that smoke got its way all the way to Montreal. You know, we're, we're, we're breathing the effects of this right now. It is, it's an existential uh, threat and, and it needs to be uh, treated as such. And we need to be doing whatever we can in our jurisdiction to be able to address the, address the challenge. And, and, you know, yeah, I think we need to be uh, sort of throwing down as best as we can. And this is one of the challenges of, of the pandemic is that we were seeing a real sort of acceleration of civil disobedience on this front um, and it was having an impact. And, and we're again in this kind of transitory phase right now as we're social distancing and, and we'll see what comes out as some of those restrictions are, are relaxed. But, but yeah, we need, <laughs> we need robust action. And Jane? Yeah, I would definitely say I agree with James um, in terms of yeah, the fact that that we have like we everyone has a role to play um that this this everyone yeah everyone has a role to play in this and so i don't think i think it's really just as simple as that like we can't just be like oh it's your problem china you have to deal with it <laughs> um because it isn't it's, it's a global problem um that requires global solutions um and yeah that's that's how i see it yeah definitely kathy um so the, uh, I did some math, I did some arithmetic uh, before, um, drawing on the point that James made that we're even higher in terms of our per capita emissions. Um, if you add up all of the emissions of the 88 least carbon intensive countries in the world, they have comparable emissions to Canada. So it's not just that there's all those countries below us. Collectively, if you add them all together, the 365 million people in them have the same emissions as Canada's 36 million people. That's how bad it is. That's how great our moral responsibility, but also we are among the wealthiest countries per capita. And it's not an accident. We got rich by digging stuff out of the ground and burning it. Um, and so I think that also gives us special responsibility in terms of looking to the international stage. I think um, countries like Canada, the most emissions intensive ones, understandably developing countries are looking to us to show leadership. Uh, both in terms of the actions we take and not making arguments, well, but China's China's emissions are greater, which I know isn't what you were suggesting. <laughs> um, um, you know, there this coming year will be the first um, period where the parties to the Paris Agreement are expected to ratchet up the ambition of their national targets. I'm really hoping that there will be a change in administration and the US will have come back into the Paris Agreement and set um, ambitious targets and that Canada will match those every step of the way. Ideally go beyond, but I'm not actually um, hopeful about that. I think we need to pony up big money because the world cannot solve climate change if all of those developing countries, so many people that don't even have electricity take the same development route as we do, we need to provide a transfer of the money we made developing along a dirty path to help them develop in a clean way. There have been lots of talk about that in international fora, but we have never matched the um, commitments and Canada needs to play a role there. And the final role I think internationally that's important for us is ideally to um, engage in a conversation about winding down fossil fuel supply, or at least committing to not expanding fossil fuel supply. Cause I think we need to deal with both the, the demand side and the supply side and Canada as a major fossil fuel exporter has a special responsibility there as well because those the emissions from burning that oil aren't on our books, but we are profiting from selling it to someone else. And I think that gives us a shared responsibility for that as well. For sure. Um, so I just have one more question before we switch it over to audience questions. Uh, so starting with Emma Jane, what work either by activists, scientists, or other individuals um, across the globe uh, have you been most inspired by recently in terms of climate change? Oh, that's a really hard question. Um, 
Oh, there's so many people. Um, I think specifically within Canada, um, Autumn Peltier, who's um, an Indigenous water warrior protector, um, she is amazing and really inspires me um, in terms of the fact um, just everything that she brings has been amazing and all of the work that she's been doing from such a young age, I think is just, is just amazing and that we should all really follow her leadership. Um, oh, there's so many people, like, <laughs> it's so hard, but yeah, so she's one of the people that I really inspired by, um, as well as like, kind of like more on a personal level. Um, like I mentioned before, I worked on Amita Kuttner's uh, campaign for the Green Party leadership, and they have really inspired me in terms of their work. They're like an astrophysicist by trade, um, which is really cool. Um, and they decided to come into politics because um, like out of necessity to like create all of these changes. Um, and so I don't know, every day they inspire me to like keep going and to be like, it's okay if it's difficult, but like we can get through this together. Um, so that's like a personal shout out to them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so those two would be the biggest for me. Nice. How about you, James? Um, yeah, so I think in the United States, I would say uh, the Sunrise Movement um, in the way that they've again, <laughs> to repeat myself, have helped move uh, the idea of the Green New Deal into Sort of mainstream debate and conversation, even though it's it's contested, and they've done that through bold uh, action of sort of confrontation and civil disobedience, um, and and effective messaging. And so I think Sunrise in the U.S. is is doing excellent uh, work, and then in the Canadian uh, context, you know, I was very um, inspired by again. Uh, solidarity actions with the Wet'suwet'en hereditary uh, leadership against the coastal gas link pipeline in, in February. And I know that you know, climate change was one, well, the main issue, of course, self-determination and climate change was part of that, um, that effort to stop that pipeline. But, you know, what was inspiring to watch was with the solidarity actions across the country, you know, there was an experimentation that, that happened and it was sort of revealed that ultimately blocking infrastructure, uh, ports, and uh, particularly railways is really what brought the government to the table and resulted in an agreement for the Wet'suwet'en. It's not, um, it doesn't solve the coastal gas, gas and pipeline problem, but it makes some progress on title, which they've been seeking since 1997. And so I do think the direct action can get the goods. And I think that we got some good learning in February around targeting critical infrastructure in a way that isn't, doesn't seem particularly popular at the time, um, but it does tend to bring the government to the table. So I think there is a uh, helpful learning that happened there. Mm -hmm, for sure. Uh, Kathy? Um, I mean, it's, it's a collective action problem. So there's so many leaders, um, but at the moment I am especially inspired by young people like Emma Jane. Uh, there are Greta's everywhere and they are, you know, indigenous and Latino and um, black and white and <laughs> they're all over the world. And that's an amazing thing to behold. Um, I hope that adults realize it's not like, oh good, we can hand it over to the kids, but that the youth movement is saying, fix it. It's your job. You're the ones in position of power. I also think um, Bill McKibben and others in 350.org um, had a big impact about 10 years ago in transforming the environmental movement um, to focus on fossil fuels, on fossil fuel supply, infrastructure, the divestment movement, and sort of shifting the point of attention in a way that was very powerful politically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. So switching over to questions from people watching, um, we have a question from Renil. Uh, do you think Canada's federal system is a benefit or a hindrance to meaningful climate action? Starting with Kathy. My first book um, in 19, no, my second book in 1996 was about federalism and environmental policy. Um, mostly I would say it's been a hindrance. Um, and the problem is that the, the carbon intensity of provincial economies in Canada is so different and we have a relatively 
decentralized federation, and we have an expectation, it's a norm, not a constitutional requirement for consensus. Canadians love it. They want everyone to get along together. And that means that Alberta has regularly vetoed stronger national policies. Ontario used to veto anything stronger on um, motor vehicle emissions. There was a brief period from um, 2015 to 2018, where I would say that federalism, federalism actually opened a window of opportunity and the Trudeau government was able to say, we'll build on things in partnership with provincial governments. Um, and that did lock in some better environmental policies, but then it all unraveled um, in late 2018. And we will see if the Supreme Court of Canada does not uphold the federal carbon tax. Um, and they had hearings the week before last, we'll have a decision in a few months. Um, I, we will have lost years again. Yeah, definitely. Emma Jane. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a couple of things here. I think I personally, I think a lot of people agree <laughs> the fact that like single member plurality systems are just like not great in general. <laughs> Um, and so in terms of, of that aspect of our electoral system, I would say that um, it, it, it hinders just democracy in general and it hinders um, it, it hinders the ability for us to have a, a really important say. And so I, I would include like climate justice issues in that as being um, part of one of the reasons why um, it doesn't get through is because of our terrible electoral system. However, I don't think that's that's the that's the main reason. I think the main reason is is power um, within politicians. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to see changes to our electoral system. Um, and but I think that in terms of I would like to see changes to our electoral system in terms of like democracy, not necessarily specifically climate justice. Although I think it would help it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, James? Yeah, I'd agree with Kathy that it's a, a hindrance, um, but you know we're going to have to address the climate change challenge within our federal system here in Canada in the same way that we're going to have to address climate change within the contours of, of capitalism. And that's not to say that I, I don't think we can have robust conversations about alternative political formations and, and alternative economic formations as well. I think we need to be having those conversations. Um, but we do have a, a relatively short time frame. Uh, you know, we've got to cut emissions in half in this country in the next 10 years. And so we're going to have to do that um, within the system that we have, the federal system that we have. So, you know, that said, you know, again, climate change or climate science points to nonlinear shifts in climate systems, and that can also result in nonlinear shifts in political systems. And so, you know, it's possible that with utter climate catastrophe that we'll have the reorganization of political and economic systems, but it does seem like in the meantime, we're gonna to have to solve this with uh, what we got. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um... So we have another audience question. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, throw your questions in the chat. Um, we have like space for one or two more questions. Uh, so this question asks, um, we know that climate change has a mobilizing impact, but does it have the impact that can elect a climate focused party even under the first past the post? Starting with James. Um. So yeah, no, I'd say no, <laughs> just the easy answer. Um, not, not in the short term anyhow. And I think that part of that is that for reasons that I've already articulated on, on this call, that I think that um, so far the right has been pretty successful in this country and in the United States is in framing environmental policy as a threat to livelihood for working class people. And, and so I think that there have been great gains made within uh, the environmental movement, thanks to leadership from folks like uh, McKibben and others around uh, sort of opening up discussion around how we can make climate change policy something that's attractive to uh, working class folk. And I think that's partly where a public investment approach uh, comes in, where job creation is utterly central to uh, to the pathway forward. Um, 
so yeah, that that's that's the that's the road ahead, I think, in terms of making these policies uh, genuinely uh, majoritarian uh, policies. Uh, that said, we've seen significant growth within the Canadian polity in terms of climate change moving up to being, you know, along with healthcare, being one of the top two issues. Ten years ago, it wasn't anywhere near that, and so thanks to uh, climate strike and other uh, and other movements, we've seen a shift, and and I hope that continues. Mm -hmm. Jane? Yeah, so I'd agree with James. Like, no, I don't think that, um, well, I think like right now we're not seeing that. Like, it's not really working. Um, and uh, it hasn't changed um, much of our, the outcome of our elections. Um, however, I do believe that there, like, there's always possibility. And I like to think about that there's hope for that to change, even under first past the post. Um, but my hope for that is kind of running out today by day, um, but I, I do still think it's possible. Kathy? Um, the public concern about climate change has been pretty stable, little bits of ups and downs. Um, public attention to climate has been um, much sharper cycles, and in fact, it was environment and climate was number one um, in um, 2008. Um, it was the top issue on the public's agenda. And then the global financial crisis came and then it's, it's taken off again, I think, I hope. Um, we'll see what COVID does to that, but it was sort of number two, number three in the 2019 election. And one of the interesting things we've seen is that when, um, environmental issues generally and climate in particular become very salient for voters, all parties move their positions. Um, the, the trick is having that, locking that in long enough that they actually follow through and pass laws and regulations and do the things that they said they would need to do. But, um, you know, these are democracies where people are elected and even the most fervent um, fossil fuel defenders can change their stripes if their job's on the line. Mm -hmm. um, so that looks like that's all our questions. Uh, do you, any of you have any last things that you think are important to hit on or anything that wasn't asked that you want to talk about today? I see one question about um, carbon capture and storage. Oh, in, right. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, right. So that question to... is, isn't investing in carbon or methane capture and storage technologies easier to sell to the folks on the right? It may feel like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet wound, but we may be able to get people back on board quickly. In any case, I think it's already too late to reverse current warming trends with uh, carbon emission reduction alone. What are your thoughts on that, Kathy? So I think we are going to need um, negative, negative emission technologies um, just to get the kinds of emissions reductions <laughs> that we desperately need. Um, What's troubling to me is that in a lot of the modeling, just how much negative emissions technologies they're assuming. And what troubles me is how easy it is for, um, for governments, for the oil industry to promise that they will get to net zero, that they will offset their emissions um, with negative technologies and without saying how much are you counting on that negative stuff? Because otherwise it's like an emperor has no clothes promise. Like we'll just keep doing what we're doing and magical technologies will appear. And so I'm more worried about the false promise undermining um, the will to do what needs to be done than, than I see potential for offering CCS to sort of lure people into the tent. I'm seeing some very troubling things, you know, promises from oil companies to be at net zero when they're actually not even investing in alternate technologies. Do you have thoughts on this, Emma Jane? Yeah, I would say like, I am not convinced that there's evidence that shows that carbon capture alone will be able to solve the crises we're facing right now. <laughs> um, like it's just, it's not there. Um, 
And honestly, I think kind of going down that rabbit hole will um, distract us from the actual um, opportunity we have to transform our society. Um, so I think that it, it could be possibly used as a tool, not completely ruling that out, but it cannot be the main thing at all. There's just no evidence that supports that right now. Yeah, I would agree with that. James? Yeah, I just totally agree with uh, what Kathy and Emma Jane, Emma Jane had to say. Um, the technology isn't uh, there yet. It's extraordinarily expensive. Uh, it's been sort of soaking up a lot of investment that could be going in other uh, more promising areas. We will likely, as Kathy said, need negative emission technology, but it, it's sort of risky as a distraction and need to be focusing on um, drawing down our fossil fuel infrastructure right now and rolling out alternative uh, energy infrastructure to replace it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I think that was a good note to anyone. I'm, I'll just read this loud so that it will be captured on the uh, YouTube video as well. But um, Kathy said, bioenergy with CCS would be an emissions removing technology, CCS in combination with clean energy, not dirty. Um, sorry, to, to contextualize for anyone who's watching this afterwards. Um, but yeah, is there anything any of you would like to note that wasn't discussed already um, before we conclude today's event? Um, I guess I'll just say one thing is that, um, you know, I, I feel like a lot of learning has happened within the environmental movement over the last decade, especially on questions of decolonization and increasingly on questions of racial justice in Canada and the United States. And I think that there's uh, a tremendous amount of learning that, that still needs to happen, but you know, in the academic world, we're, we're sort of taught to find the gap uh, that needs to be addressed and to have a sort of um, negativity bias in that regard. But I'm actually very heartened with leaders in the environmental movement in terms of the way that these lessons are being internalized and, and are impacting uh, the way that the movement is manifesting and presenting itself. And so in as much as the world is going to hell, I actually feel uh, quite hopeful about leaders in uh, young leaders uh, like Emma Jane in, in the environmental movement, Absolutely. climate justice movement. I would agree with that. Um, anyone else? Kathy, you just put your finger up, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between um, prediction um, you know, and hope. We're not going in the right direction. And if I, you know, sort of my academic side, I'm very good at explaining why things are going badly. So am I optimistic? Eee, not so much, but um, the writer Rebecca Solnit has made a really important distinction between optimism and hope. Optimism is what we think is gonna happen. Hope is the possibility that we can make it better. And I get out of bed every damn morning making a choice to be hopeful and to look for the things that can change so that we can turn around that curve. And I think if we all do that, that could make a big difference. So I don't think we should be discouraged, but I think we have to choose to be hopeful. Yeah, I think that's a good point right now, especially because we're seeing increasing levels of like uh, climate anxiety among young people, especially. Um, Emma Jane, did you have something you wanted to add to this? Uh, just that uh, this whole entire idea of like shifting our society has has to be um, part of a giant shift towards decolonization. And I just want to really make that point clear. Um, it's something that I really, um, it, it has to be a part of it, um, specifically within like the Canadian context, um, but also across the world. Um, I think colonization has really furthered many of these issues that we see right now. Um, and so a focus on decolonization has to be at the center. Yeah, definitely, 100%. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for coming here and taking the time kind of after very long days uh, to share your perspective on this topic. Um, and I uh, hope we can all remain hopeful about the future, if not optimistic. But um, yeah, thank you so much. I think this was very um, informative for everyone. But yeah, um, and thank you everyone who's in the audience tonight watching. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, hope so good to meet all of you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, likewise. Hi. All right. Um, hope you all have a good rest of your nights. All right. Bye. Bye. Take thanks. care. Good night.